I hope you all managed to get some pizza. Any pizza left back there? Okay, well, welcome. Welcome to the first WPLDN of 2020. And what a night it is. We have got two fantastic speakers this evening and two speakers who I know can talk, which we are really excited about. But it does mean that we need to be a bit prompt on our timings this evening to make sure we've got enough time for both our speakers. So I'm just going to quickly run through a few bits of housekeeping, mention a few things, just so you're aware of what's going on tonight. Uh, and I'm going to make I'm going to make a couple of little pleas as we go through this this evening. So first off, uh, welcome. Just wanted to run through the uh, format. We're going to we've got two speakers this evening, as I've mentioned. Uh, could I just ask that your mobile phones are on silent, out of respect for the speakers, please? That includes the speakers. There is Wi-Fi available should you need it. Uh, you're looking for the SSD, SSID hot desk and it's the five pace uh, for the password. Uh, again, just to make you aware, there will be some photographs taken this evening. We are also live streaming the event. So if you do not want to be in the live stream, I suggest you don't stand around here. Welcome to everybody that's out there on the live stream. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are some. there is a camera floating around taking some photos. If you would prefer not to be uh, in those photos, if you prefer not for us to share photos of you, please do let one of us know. I'll mention uh, who, who your hosts are this evening in a moment, just so you know who to look out for. Just out of interest, who's here for the first time this evening? Excellent. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening. And thank you all of you that have clearly been here before. Uh, great, to, uh, great to see you again. I uh, just want to give a very quick mention uh, to WPNUP. WPNUP is a charity that's supporting and promoting positive mental health within the WordPress community. It's, these, it's WPNUP that is enabling these events to happen. So the, these events are funded by the sponsors of WPNUP. WPNUP in turn then funds these events. So I just wanted to give the uh, website WPNUP.org a quick mention. Just also want to say interested in getting involved in WPNUP in any way, uh, we have an open Slack community that's available for any of you to join, wpnup.org forward slash Slack. It's a great place for you to uh, continue some conversation, continue the discussions around not just simply mental health, but everything relating to your businesses, everything related to being a freelancer. Maybe you're a distributed team member and just want to have a uh, connect with other community members. This is a great place to do that. So as I mentioned, uh, there are actually four hosts this evening. Uh, so myself, Dan maybe. Uh, we have got Diane over here giving a big wave. We have also got Leo over here on the camera. And Paul, where are you Paul? Hiding over here with the camera. So this is the man, if you don't want to be in front of the camera, let this man over here know, or any one of us, if you see that he's pointing the camera in your face. Okay, I just wanted to give a very quick shout out to our sponsors. Uh, as I said, these, these sponsors are sponsoring WPNUP, which is in turn enabling us to be able to deliver this event. I also wanted to give some big shout out particularly to Weglot. Uh, Weglot is a multilingual plugin uh, that enables you to translate your site and display your website in multiple languages. The Weglot team have recently confirmed that they will be sponsoring WPNUP for the for throughout 2020. So we'd really appreciate it if you could give the Weglot team a big shout out. <laughs> if you visit weglot.com or take a look at their social, uh, I'm sure they'd appreciate a thank you via social media. Right, I also need to give a big shout out to Dolly. Dolly is our latest sponsor is a turnkey solution for WordPress product vendors, agencies, and developers. If you're interested in finding out more about Dolly, then I suggest you visit getdolly.com. Uh, we do also have Stuart in the room this evening. Stuart, do you want to come and just give us a quick hello? So Stuart is part of the uh, Dolly team. Uh, he and I have had several conversations around this, and please be very kind to this gentleman. Thank you, Dan. Um, this is the first time I've been in front of anyone, so 
apologies for the cock-ups. I have notes. I'll not bore you too much. Um, just wanted to explain in a nutshell. In a nutshell, there we go, what we are. We are a cloud-based e-commerce style solution for WordPress developers and agencies looking to provide white label design and hosting solutions for their customers in a turnkey environment. The platform allows developers, vendors, and agencies to sell custom pre-configured WordPress solutions to their clients as a ready-to-go service. Why have I written that down? Because it's took us that long to actually think about what we actually are looking to do and help with the uh, community. Um, but if you want to chat, I'll be at the back. Um, thank you very much. There you go. Excellent, Stuart. Thank you so much. And I'd say a big, big thank you to uh, companies like Dolly, Weglot, uh, and various others that have supported WP and Up and uh, enabling us to deliver these events. I have on Twitter just sent out a tweet saying we are incredibly happy to announce that Get, Get Dolly have become the latest company to sponsor WP and Up by supporting WPLDN through 2020. I'd love it if you could get your phones out, if you're on Twitter right now, and just give that a little retweet because it really is enabling us to be able to deliver um, these kinds of events by having companies support us in this way. Companies will only support us if they see that we are interacting and engaging and ultimately buying their services. So I really do suggest having a look. Dolly is a really interesting solution, uh, something quite unique in the space at the moment. So getdolly.com. I also wanted to give a shout out to Blue37, uh, a strategic thinking team of digital experts with a creative edge. There are companies such as Blue37, Dolly and Weglot are sponsoring these events. So they're inputting cash, they're putting money into these events and enabling us to do this. Our supporters, Sotic, a, uh, a digital sports agency delivering high profile, high traffic sports sites on WordPress. Leo sitting over here, volunteering his time doing the live streaming for us. So I think a big shout, a big thank, round of applause. <laughs> we also have Paul Smart, Paul Smart, web design, marketing, and consultancy for businesses who seek growth through digital. Standing at the back there with the camera. And uh, Diane, we don't actually have a brand for you, do we? But Diane sitting here tweeting. <laughs> Diane deserves a big round of applause for the time that's given him. <laughs> okay, so on to tonight. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, we've got two fantastic speakers. Uh, both Pisha and Lee are really excited to have both on this evening. Uh, Pisha will be talking to us about visual perception and memory. Uh, and Lee will be sharing his experiences of po the positive impact small achievable actions can make. So very excited about that. But before we go on to our speakers, I uh, just wanted to offer up an opportunity. If you are aware of anything that's going on in and around the WordPress community, uh, then this is an opportunity just to stick your hand up and let us know. Maybe you're looking to hire somebody, you're looking for uh, hires, maybe you're looking to be hired. Uh, maybe you know of an event that's going on. It's just an opportunity just to let us as a community know. Uh, and Giles, would you mind just running the mic, please? Sorry. If anybody out there has anything they want to share with us as a community, then now is your opportunity. So, anybody aware of anything that's going on? Hello. We, <coughs> we have Agency Transformation Live the 5th to the 7th of May. No, 6th to the 8th of May, oh my gosh. <laughs> in Wellingborough, with awesome speakers such as Peacher and all the gang. So check it out, agencytransformation.live. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I had the privilege of being able to attend ATL last year, and it was a fantastic event. I highly recommend grabbing yourself a ticket if they are still available. Have you got, yeah, still got tickets? Excellent. Uh, and the website, Agency Transformation. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Fantastic. I, as I highly recommend uh, if you have an opportunity to attend that event. Anybody else aware of anything else that's going on? Yes. Hello? Okay. Yeah, they do need to be quite close, unfortunately, <laughs> these microphones. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm an um, Elementor user with WordPress. 
Uh, we have a meetup that takes place once a month, and they one we had one yesterday last night. So if anyone's interested in coming along, come along to the Elemental meetup next month. So yeah, I'll, I'll send you the details for that. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. So that's is that the last Wednesday of each month? It's a bit random at the moment. It's a bit random at the moment. So okay. Yeah, so sure. meetup.com for details. Um, just just talk to me. Yeah. Just okay. Uh, you know, <laughs> we'll I, just I, talk I, to you. I have to. I'll have to Google that. You know what I mean? So yeah. Uh, yeah so okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, this, this is the beauty of WordPress. We've got obviously our WordPress meetups that are going on, but now we have seeing these kind of subsets of WordPress meetups, which is absolutely fantastic to see in the community. We really are creating a healthy, thriving community. So fantastic to hear about Elementor. I think uh, we got one here. Yes. Yeah. Hey guys, I uh, wanted to invite you to something that we actually opened up for early access uh, literally yesterday. Uh, so it's very, very fresh, but very, very cool. We already have a few hundred people that are walking around in there and playing around. Basically, it's like a community, uh, a platform that is dedicated specifically to WordPress, where we have uh, unique tools that help all of us um, uh, feedback each other's designs, get better at it. Uh, uh, but also like a local sandbox that you can uh, experiment with different tools and all these kind of stuff. Um, one of the coolest thing is we brought a lot of the uh, uh, influencers and like ex from the space into this platform. Uh, <laughs> so we brought in a lot of experts from the space to manage each one of the groups. For example, Pitcher is managing the design group uh, in there, and uh, we got a lot of. Uh, um, you probably know a lot of the guys, as well as Alex doing SEO and marketing in there. Um, so come on board, my.wpfeedback.co. Uh, it's free to join. And, uh, yeah, no one knows about oh, this except for you guys, and we can sign up for you guys. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you. So we've got a bit of an exclusive there, my.wpfeedback.co, uh, if you're interested in the community. Uh, Pisha, do we have... Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm giving a UX workshop in Worthing, of all places, next Tuesday. And I think there is a still a few spots. And by now, then I should tell you what the URL is to book. But I don't know it <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not organizing it. But I think it, it's on, uh, on Eventbrite. So I think you would find a UX workshop in Worthing. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Excellent. Absolutely. And if you want to use the hashtag WP. LDN, uh, we follow that and make sure that we'll get your messages shared across the uh, community. Any other community announcements at all? Yes, Chris. Uh, hi, everyone. There's, um, is it next weekend, uh, WordCamp Glasgow? Um, yeah. This one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, um, that's something I know that's going on. Um, at the moment, I think it's the only UK WordCamp going on confirmed this year. Uh, and yeah, that's next weekend. So. Absolutely right. Yes, thank you, Chris. We've got the, the uh, as you said, the only currently confirmed WordCamp in the UK at the moment uh, is Glasgow, 2020.glasgow.wordcamp.org. Out of interest, uh, who any, anybody been to a WordCamp before? Excellent. So that's about half the room if been. So that means there's about half that hasn't been. Uh, if you've not been to a WordCamp, again, really, really recommend you getting along. These events are uh, incredible. They're, so they are, ooh, ooh, you're right there, Liam. Uh, these events are open, uh, open to all. They are um, very focused around, uh, obviously focused around WordPress. They are a WordPress conference. The tickets are always very, very low cost. For example, WordCamp. Uh, Glasgow tickets are currently available at £20. Now, this is a tech conference available. The uh, work camps often come, you often have a, uh, a full conference day as well as sometimes a contributor day. So they can vary in length between one day and three days in format. Uh, they often have multi multiple tracks. So for example, work camp Glasgow actually has two tracks. So you can see quite a wide variety of topics uh, covered 
uh, throughout the throughout the day. So again, really do recommend heading along to a WordCamp if you have an opportunity to. If you want to go a little bit further afield, you could head to the first WordCamp Asia. So we have regional WordCamps. So currently we have WordCamp US, WordCamp Europe, and WordCamp Asia is being launched. So this is the first one that's happening on the 21st to the 23rd of February. So not much time uh, if you haven't already booked your tickets, your flights, and your accommodation. But it is a really good opportunity to get along and see uh, a larger, uh, a, 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 um, sorry, a large group of the community. We, we are expecting around 1,400 attendees for WordCamp Asia. The contributor day is happening on the 21st of. Just out of interest, have we got anybody here that's actually attending WordCamp Asia? Excellent. Anybody here that's thinking about attending WordCamp Asia? <laughs> yes, it is, unfortunately. It's going to be a fantastic event. A little bit closer to home, WordCamp Europe. So this is happening in Porto in Portugal, uh, and the not the 21st to 23rd of February. <laughs> I've got the wrong details here. Uh, work, yes, thank you. June 4th, 5th, and 6th. Sixth, really should know this. <laughs> uh, 2020.europe.wordcamp.org. Uh, WordCamp Europe is currently the largest WordCamp uh, globally, I believe. We had I th around 3,500 attendees for 2019 in Belgium. Uh, sorry, in uh, Berlin. Uh, and we are expecting similar numbers for Porto in Portugal. So again, uh, really worthwhile investing some time uh, and energy into attending this event if you are interested in seeing what's happening. What, so WordCamp Europe, I think, had three tracks, had a cafe. Had, uh, there was multiple things going on, um, way more than you'd normally see within any regular WordCamp. It really was an incredible event. Right, so a little closer to home, WordCamp London. <laughs> this has been a big question. There's been a big question mark hanging over WordCamp London for quite some time. WordCamp London historically happens in April. Uh, this year, unfortunately, it is not going to happen in April, but that's not to say it's not going to happen. Uh, the team of organizers, or the, the individuals that are considering organizing, got together recently, and we've, we've been discussing lots of potential changes within WordCamp London, looking at venue, looking at um, formats, lots of things that we're considering um, as to how to deliver to you the community. Now obviously we would love to hear from you the community and we would also like you the community to get involved in supporting this. So if you're interested in supporting London 2020, uh, then do come and have a chat with myself. Uh, have we got any of the other organizers in the room at the moment? We've, we've got lots of previous organizers with us. <laughs> uh, do come have a chat, we are looking at uh, later on in 2020, uh, though, so uh, as I mentioned, we're looking at potential venue changes uh, and a number of things that will impact and obviously need us to move the date away from the uh, original April date. Okay, any questions, anything, anybody got anything at all they want to know uh, across Work at London or any of the other events that I've mentioned at all? Am I going? to all of them. <laughs> uh, I am due to be at Asia, yes. So we shall see. Partly comes down to what we're talking about here. I <laughs> just wanted to give a quick mention to, again, I've already mentioned WP and UP. Uh, it is a registered charity and it does require the support of the community. Doesn't mind visiting WP and UP forward slash donate if you feel that there's potentially some value out of this event tonight. Donate a pound. Really appreciative. If you love to see your brand in front of our audience, in front of the other events, we run events across the UK currently. WPNUP.org forward slash sponsor is the uh, URL that you want to hit. But that's enough from me. Uh, I am now going to introduce you to our first speaker of the evening, Fisher, uh, with a background in uh, art theory. Yes. <laughs> It's quite an honor, actually, to have Fisher up here because we met many, many, many years ago at this event. Uh, and we've been able to stay in contact. And it's fantastic. This is the first time you're speaking at this event, isn't it? Yeah. So 
Really excited. Uh, Apicia has been speaking at conferences for quite some time now, haven't you? And it's been an incredible journey. Uh, and we're really excited. So this... Absolutely. And and this this just goes to show, if you are interested, if you have a story, if you are interested in sharing your knowledge, then this is a great place to come and start. Uh, if you're thinking about speaking at any of the upcoming work camps or other events, ATL for example, then these types of events are a really good place to come and try it out and see what the audience reception to it is like and, and test your talk. So that's enough from me. I'm going to hand you over to Pisha. We are just going to need to change over the laptops. Uh, so excuse us for a moment while we do that. Nice slick changeover. <laughs> Go for it, lady. Let's have some music. Anybody thinking about speaking at an event? Anybody got anything they feel they might want to share with you, with the community at some point? Everybody sitting on their hands? <laughs> We're not that scary. Anyway, I'm now going to hand you over to Pisha, and thank you very much. A big round of applause, please. Hi, so he said it already. I was going to start with that, but I don't need to now. You already know. So I've been speaking... In a lot of places and a lot of, you know, all over the world, but this is, a, for me, is kind of the most significant because when I first started coming here, I don't know how many years ago, I would hide in a corner the first few times because I thought, these people are amazing, they know everything, I know nothing. And now I'm speaking here, so that's great. I'm very happy to be here. Then I just want to explain that this is the talk that I will be giving at WorkCamp Asia. So I'm actually actively seeking feedback i would really like to know what you think pro seriously so uh, any kind of feedback is is welcome now and then also before i start so that's what i'm going to be talking about visual perception and memory how to win on the web thanks to better visual communication i'm going to start by saying that i would like you to pay attention to the title i can't change it now because they've said no sorry too late you can't change it but i'm not entirely sure that it's the right title maybe it is i don't know so i'd like to know your um your opinion on that then first things first again shout out from me to cloudways who are a um a, a hosting platform that i work with and whom i thank so much for um allowing me to go around the world to give these talks. So they are some, they are pillars of the community as well. So thank you so much. Now let's get started. First of all, let's look at this image for five seconds. Let's look again. Changes. Any changes? The woman crossing, has anything changed? What's changed with her? I, c I can't, D you need to be more. No, <laughs> that is the whole point. <laughs> no, so the, someone said the woman crossing, anything else? No, I'm just gonna go ahead. So, let's start. Lady in the corner, she's there in the first one, not there in the second one. Color of the shirt of the men walking. Then post box, gone. Then that window is obscured. And then this one's really, this one's not fair because there's no way you can see the difference on this screen. But there is a slight change. I know, I know. It, lo it looked, you know, it made sense on my computer, but it's all right. So the, you, you're let off for that one, but there were five changes there. However... Sorry? <laughs> well, you can. Now, actually, you can interrupt, but, you know, don't. But you can. No, I'm joking. You, you totally can. You totally can. So, basically, it's not you. It's just the way we perceive the world. It's, it's, it's not that you, you know, you, you are uh, not good at noticing details. It is the way that we perceive the world. So, 
What we'll talk about in this talk is basic perception mechanisms, then how memory and attention work together, then the types of visual perception processes, and the takeaways from all this for better design, sort of peppered in between, and the one rule that you will ever need. So that's good to know, I hope. Then, first of all, as we were saying, basic perception mechanisms and how memory and attention work together. Because this is, and the reason why I repeat it, even though I just said it, is that this is a huge and really complicated subject. And it's taken me quite a while to work out the best way to present it, which is also why I'm asking for your feedback, because obviously I'm not, this goes from neuroscience to psychology to um, optics, optics, yeah, the way the eye works, yeah. And all, I'm, not, I'm none of those things. I'm just a designer who wants to do the best. For, for my users. So I've, I've tried to distill what, work, what we need to know, basically. And, but it's a huge and complicating field. So what is perfe perception, basically? Perception is the gateway, gateway to understanding our world. And these are the words of a psychologist ca called Bruce Goldstein. Because like I said, there are so many interconnected fields that uh, deal with this. So perception is a process, when we define it, that involves the receipt of information via sensory organs and via prior experience. What does this mean? mean? Prior experience, first of all, is what we call knowledge. That's clear, isn't it? Things that have happened to us before. And then, in other words, we use our senses which is what we hear and see and smell and taste and touch, and our memory, which is where we store our knowledge, in order to recognize and make sense and interact with the world around us. Again, this is quite ableist because I'm talking about the people that have all these senses, but that's what I'm talking about now, so forgive me if that's, that's, if that's limiting for other people, but I'm I am talking about visual perception, so that is in and of itself already clearly uh, delimitates. So one of the mechanisms that helps to speed up uh, visual perception is recognition, which is a mental process that identifies sensory input on the basis of representations stored in our memory system. Is this clear? Yeah? Um, so basically, we identify inputs by comparing them with what is stored in our memory. So prior knowledge allows us to attach meaning to ex external experience. And to clarify, is like when we see an object in our surroundings or an animal, such uh, the recognition uh, process enables us to categorize it, like this is a dog and this is a cat, so that we can turn the constant stream of sensory input into a meaningful body of knowledge that we can draw from. Because otherwise, we would go mad trying to constantly repeat the same processes when we see something. It's just, uh, you know, when, when we see something that we've seen before, we need to have a system that allows us to, to recognize it. Because our brain is constantly choosing the path of least resistance. The best way to make as little effort as possible. And that's why, usually, we see the whole before see the parts and we only focus on details later and this is by the way I'm not gonna it, it's the basic tenet of a theory of vision that's called uh, gestalt so when we see a cat first we see the whole cat and then we take in the individual details that are part of a cat well we don't need to focus on the details to know that that's a cat we perceive the form as a, as a whole so when we see a scene and we, un we understand it as a whole, but we don't look at the details, we don't need that. This is a street scene, we don't need to know anything else. It's just, um, there's also another reason why we don't get the details, and that's physiological, and we'll see that very soon as well. Because this happens because we can only focus on a limited part of an image at a time. We actually visualize a limited part of the world at a time, and we actually focus on an even smaller part of, uh, of what we visualize. So in order to understand how this happens, let's have a look at how the eye works. So we started from psychology, we're already going into, 
into our in, uh, optical science. And I'm not going to go into all the bits because I don't even know enough about it. But what matters to us is that how do we see, do we see an image? So there's an image there. It gets uh, the light focuses on the retina, which is made, which is at the back of the eye, and it's made of more than 100 million light receptors, something like that. So the retina converts the light into electrical impulses that are sent up to the brain and interpreted. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, what, what happens. The most important region of the retina for us, for the mechanism of visual perception, is the fovea, which is here. Teeny, teeny, tiny. So that's why the, the fovea is the, is the region where we, uh, that, gets the, where, that gives us the sharpness of vision. So everything else on the periphery of the retina is blurred out. The fovea is where we focus, and it's tiny. So that's why um, we can only see a limited part of an image, and we can only focus on a limited part of an image. So if you were looking at the image before, you were looking at the center, you can't, you can't see uh, the details. So that's, that's why. Now, there are videos. Let's see how I started. Start, start, yeah. Right. So as a consequence of this, our eyes must move repeatedly all the time in order to keep the areas of most interest imaged on the fovea. That's what we want to keep the focus. So uh, these movements, these rapid eye movements that we can make all the time are called saccades. And they're the mechanism that allows us to select images from our surroundings. All clear so far? Yeah? Not overwhelming yet? Okay, good. That's, that's, that's good to know. So in between saccades, our, eye, uh, our eyes rest for like three seconds. And that's when we extract the visual data and we process it, send it to, to the brain. But it happens so quickly, we're absolutely not, not aware of it. This is completely, uh, we're not aware of that. So again, the result of all this that's most interesting to us when we design is that we take images, we take in images that are placed where our eyes is focus, eye is focusing. So a typical, you know, uh, well, not even web, but digital uh, environment example is that if I'm concentrating or writing something and I forget to save, then it's absolutely vital that the notification is placed where I can't possibly miss it. So, first takeaway take for web design from design in general, actually, from the saccadic movement is that we must place important information where the eye is currently focusing. Now, a lot of these takeaways that you'll see will be like, yeah, that's obvious, isn't it? But it's not that obvious, actually. We often don't do it, and it's never too obvious in my, in my experience. So, and this is not always the center. Now, if, if anyone here has ever listened or watched me do the uh, UI and UX reviews that I do, they already know that I don't like centered information. No one's laughing, but you would if you were. It's become a bit of a running joke that things shouldn't be in the center for me. But it's, there are reasons, because uh, th there are various reasons why things shouldn't necessarily be in the center. First of all, because here in the Western culture, we start reading from the left. If you look at heat maps on websites, often they start from left for a reason. But also because your user's phobia may be focusing on where the eye was resting before. So it may not have been the center. It may have been where you last had something that you wanted them to be focusing on. So basically, when we design on the web, we decide where to send them. So that's why I always find centered, centered layouts just lazy at best, because it's like, can't you do better? Can't you, you know, direct? You've got that option. You've got that power of directing people. So do something about it. Anyway, so. The important thing, the, the, I sort of slightly digress from that, but the, the very important thing is that focus relies on attention. I said earlier that you know, it's where you, the eye was focusing before because focus depends on attention, which is a key ingredient in our conscious experience of the world. And this is where I think if it goes, it gets incredibly fascinating for me because, and we'll get there, but attention 
allows us to focus on important information while limiting the interference of unimportant details. Deep down, it's still because our brain doesn't want to work, you know, really. That's, that's, that's basically why, deep down. However, anyway, we're, we're constantly scanning our environment for personally relevant, interesting, and useful information. And we um, discard the rest that we don't deem relevant. So attention is a cognitive process of searching the environment for stimuli, and then we, we search for stimuli, we find them, and then we focus on them. That's the process. And uh, the allocation of attention is completely vital for our visual perception because it guides our senses to what is important, discarding what isn't. And unattended details, there's a really, I mean, not, I'm not, again, I'm not a re researcher. That's what I find out when I go and look for these things. But there's a, a significant body of research, apparently, that says that unattended re details never reach awareness and never get stored in our memory. The other bit that is incredibly interesting is that Actually, our brain is a, it's sort of by the by, because it's not particularly relevant to this, but I find it incredibly fascinating that if we did, maybe, you know, 40 years ago, if we did notice something, and we've since completely forgotten about it, it's still there. We don't know it's there, but it is retrievable. But that's not about the talks, so I'll leave it. But anyway, I find it so fascinating. So our brains are much bigger than a computer hard drive, basically. So again, we don't see what we're not paying attention to, and we don't memorize it. So we don't store into our memory the details that we didn't pay attention to. That's why you can't tell the difference between these two photos, because there was no reason for you to notice that the post box wasn't there anymore. Just no reason why. So why would you? So this phenomenon actually has a name, and it's called change blindness which is the inability to detect changes in a visual, which you've just seen the demonstration. You can't detect uh, changes within a visual scene in a real world situation because we literally can't see where we don't pay attention to. There's lots of really interesting um, experiments on the web with this. If you search for change blindness, you find them. I couldn't show them all to you, so I won't, but you can find them. Hundreds of examples of things that drive, in the digital environment, there are so many examples of things that drive us crazy because of of uh, change blindness, and to me, bloody autocorrect, because it, at least on the iPhone, it gives you a word, and then it sort of instantly changes it, and you don't notice, because you've already, you know, you're concentrating on writing, and then the hilarious stuff happens, and it happens absolutely all the time, and it's just, a, you know, endless sor uh, source of merriment and frustration. So that's one thing, and it's also another reason why you shouldn't use Sliders, is that so? Yeah. So you shouldn't, you know, if you ever needed another reason why you shouldn't use sliders, this is one, you know, so you got it. Another one in your arsenal against clients that want sliders. So, second takeaway for web design from all this is say no to sudden changes. Just say no to them. It's just not good. Make changes very obvious. Again, you're like, ah, oh, is that the, in it, in it, I can't remember the um, English equivalent. In Italian, we say, is that, the, you know, have you discovered hot water when something is really obvious? But it's still, it's bears repeating and say no to sliders, obviously. Now, we are going to watch another video. We're, we're in London, so many of you might have already seen this, but maybe you haven't, and anyway, you're going to see it again. So now, what we're going, what are you to please do is to it's another attention game and uh, no spoilers if you have seen it so uh, just count how many times the white team passes the just count the passes of the team in white How many passes? How many? 13. Anybody else with 13? 22. Who said 22? Andrew. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. So let's, uh, let's check. I want the following slide. Is this the following slide? Yeah, it is. Well done. 
but have a watch now again, not paying so much attention to the, just looking at the scene, maybe not so much with a, notice anything? It's not a very good, uh, not very good light, but, yeah? She's seen it, have you seen it? Have you seen anything? Strange, no? We've really not seen it. The thing is, if I don't watch for it, I still don't see it. Yeah, it's not a very, the light isn't very good, but just notice if there's anything in the scene that shouldn't be there. Is that anything going on now? They, there's basically a bear moonwalking through the scene. And it was a fantastic um, uh, London Met ad for traffic awareness for cyclists, which is, you know, it proves that when they say, you know, cyclists should wear high vis, well, we shouldn't, because that's not the point. You can wear, as, you know, high vis and it's still not be seen. So that's, anyway, that's a different. But so, this is what is called inattentional blindness. And you basically miss what you're not looking for. It, isn't that incredible? And I actually sometimes, when I was um, editing this, and I, sent, I would watch that video and not see it. I literally would not see the video. I was like, I just haven't seen it again. So we are aware of a stimulus sometimes, and unaware of a stimulus, even if you're looking straight at it. So, um, and this again, it's something that happens in digital environments all the time. And we, we're especially there because we're receiving, we're receiving so many stimuli that we can uh, easily ignore what's right in front of our eyes. So that's why my notifications always have sound, because otherwise, pff, that's it. You know, it's never, I'm never going to notice. So takeaway for design is never assume that people will see your important notifications or information. Make sure that you do because, it, you know, you have, there's no guarantee at all. And if they don't see it, it's generally your fault and not theirs. So um, I, is this, have I done it right? I think, I hope this is a video. So this is how, this is a way of avoiding that, of avoiding... Um, we're avoiding that people ignore. So you take this quiz here. This is actually quite interesting user experience that she's doing. But she asks you to take a video. I sort of race through the, um, take a quiz. I race through, through the quiz because it's not particularly relevant to the, to the topic. But it's, it's great user experience, I find. Anyway, I'm stressed. I know that because Andrew told me that. Um, and uh, so she wants you basically, she analyzes your results and she wants you to get the video sent to your email address, because otherwise you won't get the free training. And it's actually a really good free training if you're interested in, in face yoga, which I am. And then, as soon as, sorry, I was talking, so maybe you didn't see that, but I'm sort of expressing exit intent, and that comes up immediately. And this is, normally I would say now, really quite against pop-ups, unless you have a very good reason, and this is a very good reason. Because I am, I actually, do want this maybe I've changed my mind but maybe I do want the training and I what I don't know is that it's gonna go the opportunity is gonna go away very quickly and she's not letting me ignore that she's like you need to get it now so I have a lot to say about the UI but you know I'm not a fan of the UI but however this you know she I can't miss that so she's thought that you know okay so I have made a mistake now for this second I should have told you I should have given you a link to the slides and I should have told you to download the slides. So, giving myself feedback, then I, I forgot to do that. Because this, I don't think this is gonna work with a screen, so basically this is, you should, if you had this in front of you on your phone, this is what I would ask you to do. I would say, please, uh, point your nose in between the cross and the dot. Cover your left eye and stare at the, you can try and do that anyway, let's see what happens, but you can't, I'll tell you why. Cover your left eye and stare at the cross with your right eye, and that get closer to the screen. At, at some point, the, the, um, the dot will completely disappear, but you can only do it if you get, uh, and then you do, it, you do it the other way around. You cover your right eye and you stare at the dot with your left eye and you get closer, and that, and then the cross disappears. What this is, is a physiological, not psychological, not attention-based phenomenon called the blind spot. 
And it's a physiological issue and not a cognitive one. So it's not related to the cognitive process of attention, but it does, it, it can affect us. So, and it's, it's sort of, it, it, it varies slightly for everyone, but not, not massively. So um, it is a significant consideration when we, when we design. So it's basically a region on the retina with no photoreceptor cells to transmit light information to the brain. So if something is there, you won't see it. And the takeaway for design it, okay, sorry, maybe that I'm saying the same thing all over again, make important information impossible to miss. And what is the typical information that we miss all the time now, we're completely blind to, is the, um, yeah, cooking notices we can't, we don't see anymore. So what we've covered so far are basic perception mechanisms and how memory attention works together. Now we're going to look at types of visual perception processes because there are two types. The first one is called bottom up and the second one is called top down. So um, some of the processes that we've seen, you will have maybe noticed, they're unconscious, while others, so th they don't require any prior knowledge, uh, while others do require knowledge. So in bottom up uh, is the process that doesn't require prior knowledge, and it responds to the very simple question, what am I seeing? And it's what am I seeing right now, whenever I'm presented with a, with a new scene. It's an immediate reaction with no conscious effort, no attention or memory, completely not influenced by prior knowledge. For instance, when I, when this is a typical bottom-up perceptual phenomen phenomenon, because when I see these dots, I perceive them as being you know, all over the place, not belonging to any same group, because they're, they're not at all together. Uh, whereas if I see them like this, then immediately I group them together and I perceive them as belonging to the same group because they're all aligned, they're tidy and they're cl very close to, to one another in space. And it's a bottom-down process that's completely instinctive and not dependent on context or on what I knew before. And it's called the law of proximity and it is a gestalt uh, principle of, of theory of, of vision, which some of you might remember from my first talk at work in London. So the takeaway for design is to make sure that elements that belong to the same group are placed in close proximity. Again, it may seem really obvious and yet I see it not done so many times or um, things are either too bunched up together or they don't have enough space. So if you look at this page, for instance, we can immediately understand that the, item on th the items on the left belong to the menu while the ones on the right the social media icon belong to, the, to a different group. And there's something else that happens that makes us immediately group the social icons together. And that's what happens when we see this, for instance. So if we see these, uh, all these red arrows going up, we think, ooh, same, they all look the same, they, they're all red and they all go up, so they're the same. If we see these, we uh, they think, oh, th these are different because they, they go down at the blue. So this is called the law of similarity. And it's another really, really simple bottom-up um, uh, bottom process that happens completely automatically and that makes us think that uh, uh, items that share feature, visual features, share also a meaning. And that's why the social icons here, when, even though they're all different, but because they've be all been made white um, and in a circle, we think, okay, they belong together. And the menu, you can also obviously exploit it the other way around because the, the current page item is different from the, from the other bits of the menu. So we think, ooh, same group because they sit together, but it looks different. So there has, there's something different about it. So takeaway for design, UI elements that perform a similar function should share one or more visual feature. And what I'm thinking about here really, and maybe I should get that example, is that very often you see uh, buttons, for, ins for instance, on a website that perform a similar function that have different copy and look different. Don't do that. It's really confusing. If a button takes you to the same place, same copy and same visual features, that's what you need to do. Um, then, another uh, uh, bottom-up perceptual phenomenon is this. Well, able to focus selectively and blur out what isn't on of interest. And this, so we isolate individual elements from the background. And it's called the law of figure ground organization. And it did 
come about when we need it to be able to, to identify immediately a predator in the field. That's really why it, uh, it, we, we have that, that ability. And it's immediate, unconscious, we just do it. So, for instance, this web page wants to do it because the form is white, but it doesn't really do it that well, does it? Because there are so many details fighting for my attention in the background. So if you do this, that changes entirely, and now I can really see what needs to stand out, which, which is the form. And this is basic exploitation of bottom-up processing in action. And we should all be doing it more and making sure that we do do it. Takeaway for design. Again, another total obvious thing, but very important, is that the most important parts of the UI must stand out clearly against the background. Then, uh, bottom-up, as we said, pre-attention, uh, and it's followed by top-down. So pre-attention is the very first thing that we do, and then we f it's f the process is followed by the top-down processing, which is when we ask ourselves, is this something that I've seen before? And I think I'm going ahead now. I didn't mean to, but that's all right, because that's done anyway, said. Um, so top-down is more sophisticated, and it does use attention as well as memory. And top-down is because what we know shapes our interpre interpretation of what we see. And that sometimes is good and sometimes not so good. Because, for instance, if we, uh, see, we, we see this dog, this as a dog, based on a top-down process, but also um, is because we, you know, this animal matches our mental, mental uh, stored information of what representation of what is a dog. But also we can't force it to be a cat. We just can't do that. You know, it's not possible. This is not a cat. And this is, you know, definitely not a dog. So uh, our experience of the world is always influenced by that. But I think it's, it, sometimes it, it, it can help and sometimes not so much. So memory, context, and culture play a really important role in top-down processing. And that's why we can never assume, and I think we'll see, we'll see an example later, we'll show that. You, we can never assume um, that something that, an interpretation that's really based strongly on context will be understood by everyone. So the takeaway for design, oh, that's a mistake. Place important items where your visitors expect to find them. Doesn't sound like it's one that should be. Uh, okay, so that's, sorry, self-feedback again. Uh, oh, yeah, no, sorry. I got it. Sorry. I did say, I did say this is, um, so, uh, it, it does make sense. What, why I'm saying this is because this is a, um, an immediate uh, top-down process result. So it does make sense. Place important items where your ex visitors expect to find them. For instance, it's really not recommended to put you know, menu items in weird places. That's what I mean. Because context and memory tell us, oh, usually the menu is over there. Don't put it you know, bottom left because I won't look for it there. That's what I meant. So yeah, it makes sense. And then the other thing is that unexpected visual trends or visual trends that are too extreme are not a good idea. Normally, it's creatives that like them, but they don't. no one else will find them helpful. So this is a top-down perceptual phenomenon. What, what do you see here? What do you see in this image? Okay, that's that what came after, but yeah, you do. And then, and then, what else? A triangle. So we're so go good. We don't at top-down processing. We don't actually need the contours of the tri triangle to to see them there. But there's a second thing that happens that I made it yellow. Um, that is that we see the Pac-Man there, but it's only because we played Pac-Man. If you were my mother, Lee, you wouldn't see Pac-Man because she's never she doesn't know what Pac-Man is. So. Um, so that's why you know, it clarifies that it's so b really based on context and culture as well, and that's why we should never make assumptions. And uh, also another thing that happens, it's another top-down uh, processing phenom phenomenon, is that it's called, the the, the, uh, it's called multi-stability, which is when there are two possible interpretations of an image, but we can only see one at once. So if, when you see the triangle, you know the pac are there, but you don't see them. You, you can only see them one at a time, basically. Uh, so, and this is called the, the principle of reification occurs when the brain fills in information, uh, f missing information based on prior knowledge. So we, you don't need the, all the information about the triangle. You see, you see it there. And there's the, the also at the same time the principle of, of multistability. This is an example of using reification because we actually don't need the whole of the 
of the circle to understand that it, that it, it is a circle. So we understand even without the whole information. So the takeaway is really important. This is what a lot of you see not done enough. Your user's mind can fill in the gaps. They really can and less can very often be more. And it really is very often truly more. Another top-down uh, mm, phenomenon that we can harness in our designs is the law of familiarity. Because what do you, I can't see anything else but a surprise face there. I mean, it's never gonna be, it's never gonna be a socket. That's a surprise face. That's that's all it is. So um, we we see faces and other familiar representations in inanimate objects all the time. In in you know cars and and. Um, clouds, and uh, it's another top-down perceptual phenomenon that is exploited very, very often. For instance, the Google uh, Doodles. So it's, the, you know, we just see things that we just, you know, we interpret. Um, and uh, so the takeaway for web design is that um, we should really, even without going, you know, to using your imagination too much, but just use familiar shapes and placements that your uh, visitors can immediately recognize. But another, you know, a, an example is um, of the law of familiarity in action is when the, this was the, the, the skeuomorphism was the trend before everything went really flat. Uh, so you use, this is, you don't need that, but it's, it's a switch that you recognize because you use it, you use it in real life. And I just want to, this is a fantastic designer, by the way. And th that's what happens when you switch on the adorable mode. So, and that's, you know, is something that you know to, you, you basically, you know to flick it. That's the whole point. You know to flick it. So, um, basically, the whole point is that in top-down processes, the usual consideration is still valid. The greater the cognitive load, the more difficult it is for us to process information, um, especially when context, context comes into play as well. So, I'm now going to give you your one and only desert island rule. I want to see if anyone can already knows already what I'm going to say. I think some of you may. What is the one and only? If there's this one rule to finish them all, what would that be? Well, I'm just going to tell you then. Just don't make them think. That's it. <laughs> Excellent. That was, thank you so much for that. So many good things in that talk. Really appreciate you Sorry taking the time. Yeah. Uh, I think possibly my wife might accuse me of inattentional blindness when it comes to looking for the butter in the fridge, to be honest. There is such, it's so easy to, uh, to miss, isn't it, sometimes? And yeah, yeah, there's yeah. so many great points there. Do we have any questions from the audience at all? Yes, so let's put the microphone. Uh, hello. Um, there's one thing that I think you failed to mention, which is the importance of typography and how that plays a role. And I, I've noticed that even within your work, there's so many details that actually you fail to kind of look at, um, even in terms of colouring, uh, spacing, like letters overlapping, and all these things play uh, like a major role. So it's, it's not necessarily just our visual perception, but it's, it's our means by which we interact, which is still largely. Um, text and type base so sorry you mean you mean in the slides because there are sometimes there's the the line height isn't right is that what you're saying in my slides i, I think sorry I, i'm not trying to slag it off but let's have a chat about this later on maybe. no 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 that's <laughs> absolutely fine because i tell you what this this uh typeface that i use which is brandon grotesque which i really like yeah. but it has ascenders and descenders that are very very tall so if when i uh, and that's something, yes, that I want to, to look at because they do sometimes touch, and I know exactly in which slides you're, uh, you're saying. Uh, uh, yeah, they do nearly touch, and that's not right. But th if I then um, increase the, the line height, then it goes way too high. So I just, it's, it's something I'm grappling with because I've been using a typeface everywhere. I can't bear to change it. Let, let, but me, it help you, let me help you with that then. Yeah, yeah, great. But, but Thank you very one much. One interesting thing is that you had that heat map, and largely speaking, 
we, we look from things from the top left, and that's probably based on the fact that we used to just read books and magazines. Now the, now the changes have kind of appeared that people are trying to grasp your attention. Um, and, and I think, again, that's why it's something like typography, alignment, and grid systems that are really, really important. Absolutely fundamental, but I just don't, didn't have the time to touch on that. I do in other, in other the, in fact, I have a talk that's just on typography, but I didn't find, I wouldn't have found the space for it here, but it's a good point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Excellent. sure. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Any other questions at all? <laughs> Over there, yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Um, I've noticed that you did everything on, um, you didn't use uh, anything on a mobile phone there. Uh, no, because it's not, it's not, this is really not device specific. It's just in general. What do you mean I didn't use a mobile phone? Sorry, well, it just. There wasn't any design using a mobile phone because if you was using a heat map, the heat map would be from top to bottom working way down. So you'd be scrolling Sorry. up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah, but then in that case, it's 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 just a different point. That's not a point I was trying to make. Maybe no, no. I mean, what I was say saying is that your eye doesn't necessarily focus on the center, and and especially if you're reading from left to right, which yep. is what we do in the West. Yeah then it won't be in the center. So that's why, that was the point I was making. So I was looking for a, an image that shows that you go from left to right. Therefore, I wouldn't look at a mobile. Because that would be maybe illustrating a different point, not that one. Right. Does, that, does that make sense? That does a little, but as you're going to Asia, you're going to change it around from right to left when yes, you go to exactly. Asia. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have asked the team. No, no, totally, totally, absolutely. I have asked them because I have been looking uh, everywhere for a for a, a an Asian language left um, heat map, and they uh, and the, I hope they're looking for it because they didn't really even. Uh, I had to explain what a heat map what was and so on in the in the Slack, but also it's not. They, for instance, if I'm not wrong, Japanese goes like this. Chinese doesn't go, you know, Chinese, you can go left to right. As well. Arabic, they go right to, to left. And I'm not, we're not going. And Hebrew. But uh, Asian languages, uh, I think that I am not an expert in Asian languages, but I did study a bit of Chinese, and Chinese goes left to right, no problem there. But I know that Japanese goes top to bottom, and, uh, and then, do you, you know a bit more, I don't know enough, but then I think that Thai, it's gone, uh, Thai, I think, uh, does anyone know, sorry, I'm, I'm not, but Thai, I think, goes to left to right as well, but it's absolutely a, a consideration that is very present. Thank you, yeah. Okay, just out of interest, and it relates to what you're talking about there, you sat here for about 20 minutes looking at a set of slides up here, there was something in the top right-hand corner. Can any of you tell me what was in that top right-hand corner at all? So just out of interest, this concept of left to right, is it important to leave the most important on the right? Because that's where they finish. I don't know if there's something around the kind of psychologi psychology of design. It's a... Uh, uh, well, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand your question actually. Then, so, Sorry, to so we, to we talk, honest. we go left to right often in in England. Uh, yeah, and right is the finishing point, isn't it? Yes, yes, so is yes, yes. Right not not always. Important? You can go like you can go in a Z. There's there's various, but I no, it's not so much that. It's sometimes is where the hell do I do I put this? Uh, and you know it's where the where the space is, and it's definitely in my case it's not the most important information. I want it to be there, but I don't want it to be the most important thing. I just I want for people to who look for it to think, oh God, it's yeah, it it is there, right? it is there, but um, but yeah, it's a good point where the where the where the eye finishes. But does the eye finish? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It's a fascinating, fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
world. I think the whole the psychology around design, I really enjoy it. Unfortunately, though, we are running short of time, so we're not going to continue. Do you? Was there anything else that you wanted to cover at all? No, no, no. no it's fine. If yeah. any, are you happy to take questions? Oh, as we of go course. into the break, yeah, yeah, yeah. totally, yeah, yeah. So we're going to have a quick break now. Um, I noticed there were a few hands that did go up there uh, just before I started speaking. So if, if you do have questions, I'm sure you'd be happy to, to take them please. as we finish. Yeah. Uh, I think a big round of applause, yeah. please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for putting up with it. I'm, I'm so so happy to have you have have you on here giving this talk at London. Uh, I really, really Thank do appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned, we are going to have a quick break now. There are a couple of slices of pizza left. There might be a few drinks left in the fridge over here. Please feel free to grab them. We're going to come back.
Take your seats and we'll get started. Right, I hope you are all suitably watered and fed. I take it there are no pizzas left? No? <laughs> yep, bit of toast, bread and butter. Okay, right, well, I am very, very excited to be able to introduce you to Lee Jackson uh, as our final speaker of the evening. Lee uh, runs, is the founder of Agency Transformation. Uh, Lee helps thousands of agency owners across the world fall back in love with their agencies. Uh, it's a real honor, similar to Pisha this evening, it's a real honor to have Lee here on stage tonight. Um, I got the, the honor to be able to speak at his event ATL uh, last year. As I mentioned at the start, and I'm sure Lee is also going to mention it, I highly recommend getting yourself a ticket if you haven't already. It is a fantastic event. Uh, but for now, I'm going to shut up and let Lee take the stage. So please give Lee a big round of applause. One, two. Hey, everyone. Right, so, uh, clicker, there we go. So, my name is Lee, and let me tell you a little bit about because it is relevant. Oh, it is directional, isn't it? I have to stand here so you can get the mic. All right, so I'm a family guy. I'm not from Family Guy. I realized that when I actually saw the presentation. So I'm a family guy, and I run a podcast. The podcast is called Agency Trailblazers. It started many moons ago as WP Innovator, and we were very much focused on WordPress, etc. And I was one of those agency owners who was super stressed out. I was always busy doing everybody else's stuff, uh, never getting any of my own stuff done as well, which was super frustrating. So if you think I've actually been building websites since about 1998 using tables. Who misses tables? <laughs> Brother. I miss tables. I, like, not kidding, yeah. When I started using cold span and row span, I felt really proud of myself because that was actually quite difficult. And you had to have a really good memory as to what was going on. But anyway, so that's what I was doing uh, back then. So I was just doing stuff for other people, never being able to achieve my own dreams and never being able to build something for myself. So I launched the WP Innovator podcast, but after two years, I'd had this plan to launch a podcast. And blooming Troy Dean did it before me, didn't he? Two more years before me, he launches his, his podcast, and then I still drag my heels for a, another two years, not achieving the things that I want to achieve. Anyway, if we fast forward to now, we launched uh, the podcast. That's been going now for about four and a half years. Uh, we've got thousands of listeners all around the world, which is crazy. And if you're not in our Facebook group, then please go to agencytrailblazer.com forward slash group because there's now at least 3,000 people in there, which is awesome. I know Alex is a member. Where's Alex? We've got Alex. We've got Vito, who's in the group. Peach is in the group. All the cool people are in the group. Santa, you need to join the group, man. So what's happened over the last few years is we've grown this personal brand in the agency space, and I've been able to run the following three companies. The first one is my original business, which is about 15 years old. It's gone through a few different iterations, but essentially it's a WAS, or website as a service. Um, and that's been offering websites to event um, companies all around the world. We've powered literally hundreds of websites, which has been amazing, all based on a WordPress platform. Uh, and we've been recently trans, uh, uh, moving everybody over to Cloudways, a little bit of sponsorship here at uh, the WP Engine office. So um, that in itself has become this huge brand that's been so exciting to be a part of. It's been so exciting to use WordPress as the platform to power all of these websites. Um, and we've since gone on to start to organize our own training events within the events industry, and we're now launching our own magazine as well. So these are all these different dreams that we've had for many, many years, and now we're actually being able to realize the things that we do. It's the same with Angled Crown. Angled Crown is a white label WordPress development company. If you design, you probably want us to do the code. That is literally what we do. And yet, out of that, we've We've been able to build consultancies. Uh, we've been able to build the actual Trailblazer podcast, etc. So much so that everything has been able to move into the new business, which is Transformed Media, 
which now has a magazine as well and the live event. So again, if you think four years ago, I was this frustrated guy who owned an agency, never being able to achieve the things that I always wanted to. I always wanted to make an impact. I always had these dreams, but never ever did it. I think I've got attention deficit disorder. Has anyone seen Up? Yeah, Up, uh, when the dog's like squirrel. That is definitely me because I'm one of those people who can't actually concentrate on things for very long periods of time. Now, the other day I was, well, it was about a year ago, two years ago, no, two years ago, I was sat in the cafe with Tim, my business partner. We basically go to the cafe and eat full English breakfasts regularly and he suddenly asked me this really deep question, what is your relationship to change? That's deep in it, yeah? Think about that. What is your relationship to change? I always spot a camera. And I didn't really know what he meant, to be honest, because I don't know anyone called change. <laughs> ah, it worked! <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, I didn't really know what he meant, to be honest. I was like trying to be all deep. But then he explained what his relationship to change was and how he always wants things to be a big splash. Uh, you know, a, a massive change, something that gets noticed, something really, really exciting. And that kind of got me thinking, you know, what is my relationship to change? And that's change in your life. That's the things that you have planned for the future. So let's let's talk about me for a bit. That's a guy from a word. That's a guy from a word camp, I think. That was a, on Unsplash, if you need that. I think everybody uses that on their blog. But this is my problem. These are my problems with change. And I want to make sure I don't mix this up. Yeah, okay. So the first thing is, is when I have, ch when I have a plan, when I want to make change in my life, I feel like it has to be significant. Like everyone has to notice it. It has to be big. It has to be, uh, has to have fireworks. It has to be Disney style, big change. If I'm going to do something, it's going to be big. Everyone is going to know about it. It has to be noticed. My mum and dad need to be crying in the background when I do something because they're so freaking proud of their son. Yeah? I'm also one of those people who is ridiculously impatient for the results. So when I launched my podcast, I wanted a million downloads and I wanted to be John Lee Dumas like within six weeks as opposed to the absolute years it's taken uh, to even breach the 1,000 listens per episode, which was a few years ago. I'm someone who wants the results. I want it to happen. I want to create the website and behold, the people will come and buy my stuff. Anyone else feel like that? I know our clients do, don't they? Yeah, mate, definitely. And then the final thing with change for me is I'm so like wrapped up in this significance uh, and being noticed because as you can tell, I like to be stood up in front of people talking. Um, and being so impatient that I wasn't really bought into the change. The, the re my reason for change, my reason for wanting to have maybe a podcast or wanting to launch an event in the events industry or whatever it was, th there wasn't any real substance to that. I wasn't necessarily changing anyone's life. I wasn't thinking that I'm doing this so that I can really change people's lives. And the cool thing is, without being prompted, I think it was you who said it, that my mission is to help agency owners fall in love with their business again. That's all I'm about because a few years ago, I utterly hated my business. I was depressed. I wanted to get out of it. I was trying to work how the hell to escape agency life. I actually wanted to work at McDonald's. Um, and nowadays, yeah, literally, I still actually look at them. And Anyone else envy the guys at McDonald's sometimes? Like, seriously, it's like no one tells you to make the burger bigger, do they? No? Um, so, <coughs> you know, and for me, it's about helping agency owners and, and helping freelancers, et cetera, who are just so freaking stressed out and maybe hate what they're doing or feel like they own their own job. So that's become my mission. Beforehand, the things that I were doing didn't really have any particular um, reason. There was no why. I think there's a book by Simon Sinek, uh, The Power of Why, I think it is. I'll start with why. Why are you doing things? And it's actually going to be that that really drives your activity. Now, here's one. I'm going to get super spiritual, but uh, I've been a Christian since I was like 14 years old. And all Christians, they kind of, apparently, they've all read the Bible, like the whole Bible. It's a ridiculously big book. And it's also pretty gruesome in places. And um, I've been trying for 17 years now to read the whole Bible. Like, 
everyone else at our church, they, they've read the Bible. They can quote scripture off the top. You know, I can read the entire WordPress codex, but I'm not really able to read the entire Bible because I get a little bit bored and I get a bit of overwhelmed with it, right? So um, as being a part of church, you know, I'm one of the lads and I'm like, you know, oh, yeah, I want to be as good as, you know, Sam over here who's read the Bible at least 15 times. So I want to read it to get noticed and to be perceived as one of the super spiritual guys at church. You know, look at this young guy with a cap on and, and he's read the whole Bible. He must be an amazing Christian. Uh, and, and that's kind of been the reason why I've tried to read the Bible for the last 17 years. And I've never gone beyond Genesis uh, or never got beyond Matthew in the New Testament. Because really, just to be a cool guy and to read the Bible for the Bible's sake is not necessarily a good reason for me to do it. Now, in the last few years, uh, we've had a few tragedies. My dad died a while back. Uh, my daughter got ill. Uh, she's had a very risky operation, which she's got through. Amazing. And, you know, I've, I've been thinking about life a lot more and my mental health and my spirituality. So I thought, you know what? Actually, I do want to read the Bible this time around, but I'm going to start with the New Testament because it's smaller. And I'm going to read a chapter a day for the next 260 days. And I've done it because m for me, I want to improve my uh, mental health, my spiritual well-being, my understanding of this thing that I'm passionate about, which will hopefully affect my life. But also, I broke it down into 262, I think there are books in the Bible. Uh, sorry, in the New Testament. There's 900 in total. That's a lot. Um, and in 260 days, I was able to achieve what I've never achieved in 17 years. And I'm not preaching, guys. I, I know I'm not in a church. I just want to give you it as a, an example. Another thing that I did was two years ago, I got all excited. And I'm pretty sure I uh, announced on one of the episodes that I was writing a book. I think every hey, show of hands, who's got a book inside them? Yeah, yeah. Most of us have actually got a book inside of us, right? And I totally have several inside of me. And I had a book inside me. It was going to be called Agency Reset. I told everyone about this book. And I've got to be honest, I felt really cool about it. I'm like, yeah, I'm writing a book. I'm going to be a published author. I'm going to put it in the gardening category so that I get a bestseller uh, and all of that good stuff. I was pretty confident that I was going to nail this book. But the problem is the reasons for writing that book were very much me wanting to look good to the community. I was a, I had this big group of Facebook uh, people and I had a a podcast, surely I should now launch a book because that's what you're meant to do to look good and to be like the other guys on the internet. That's pretty much the only reason why I was writing the book. So uh, I got quite excited about it. I didn't really outline that book whatsoever. I just wrote down a few ideas. And then I spent several days in Starbucks getting high on coffee, writing and writing and writing, and it just became this massive mammoth task. So I wrote probably a third of this book over several days but that's because, for me, my reasoning wasn't necessarily great. I was just caught up in the excitement. But then, for me, I wanted to go big, and I wanted the results now. I want it all quickly. So I, what's the best way for me to do this? It's to slog my guts out in, uh, in Starbucks. So I did that, wrote a third of the book, and never ever opened that again. I have no idea what it actually says in there. But two years later, I'd never finished that book because... It wasn't really a good reason. You know, there was part of me that wanted to help people, but most of it was just me wanting to have some sort of brag. Hey, I've written a book. Now I'm going to brag. Hey, I've actually written a book. And do you want to know how I did it? Yes. Thank you. Um, I've written a book this time around. I want to write a book because I want to help people get things done. I am somebody who does not get things done, um, or at least I have been somebody who does not get things done. But what I believe in is uh, the ability to break things down. So I've been able to launch um, the, a, a plan for myself. I, I've actually given myself a system that allowed me to not only get all those things done I showed you earlier, like launching a company, running a WAS, and all these really cool things. But I've been able to finish a book in uh, 30 days writing 500 words a day. Uh, well, sorry, it was 60 days writing 500 words a day, and then condensing all that down and doing editing, etc. So if I just 
did a little bit, a small achievable action every single day. Within two months, I'd already written the first draft of the ma uh, manuscript, and now that's with the editors, and it will be published before the event, which is pretty damn cool. So what I was able to do was break something down into small achievable actions, but also I had a really strong reason to help people. I was recognizing that people within my community were struggling to get things done. If you look at some of the posts, people have hopes and dreams. And they're still sharing the same hopes and dreams four years later. You know, when I do this, when I become a millionaire, <laughs> when I buy this new house, when I launch this new product that I'm thinking of. And people tend to just keep thinking about it, but never actually doing it. Maybe they'll start to do it, uh, and they'll go big like me, and then they'll give in. Uh, or they'll start to do it, but they've not really thought about why they're doing it, and then things start to fizzle out. You're a good guy for following through with things. Uh, <laughs> WP feedback, you'll have to check that out. But you know, you came up with an idea and you've gone for it, and that is freaking awesome. But, but there are... There you go. Yeah, uh, but exactly, until you find what you love, until there is something that you can be really passionate about. Now I'm gonna let you into the uh, world's worst kept secret. And that is to break something down. If you actually really want to achieve something, so if you want to write something as difficult as an entire book, or perhaps you have this incredible idea for a WordPress plugin that you know is just going to go crazy, um, you can break it down. Literally, you can break whatever that thing is down. The first thing I would obviously say is consider why you want to do it, if it's just to make a little bit of money, that's probably not the most compelling reason. But if you have a mission, if you have a passion, if you've got some people that you want to help, then stick your stake in the ground and say, right, I'm going to break this problem, this thing, this solution, this book, this whatever it is down into small achievable actions. Now you'll recognize this, yeah? Small tasks. You'll see small tasks inside of uh, Todoist or in your whatever app you've got, right? Sprints. So with sprints, you might break down your initial web build project. You might have a uh, maybe a wireframe sprint. You'll have your design sprint. You'll have development sprint. You'll have UAT. You'll have go live. And that'll be all phase one, and the website will go live, right? And then maybe phase two has been pushed off until next year because we want to test all these ideas. So then phase one will happen, and within sorry, phase two will happen, and within that phase, you've also got the sprints and you've also got the small tasks. So we all have this natural ability as agency owners, as freelancers, to actually logically look at a problem. I need to build a website from nothing i.e. the client says I want a website and we now need to do all of these things. We have the ability within us to actually break these things down. Um, it's a natural talent. Now this is the plug bit, but this is a plug for a reason. So this is the Agency Transformation Live event. And one of my frustrations with going to events has, in the past has been that there is so much information being given to me. I can spend two days learning all of these incredible ideas, and then I'll go away with a notebook full of stuff that I feel like I have to do. And actually, I become so freaking overwhelmed that I have no idea what is the most important thing to do. And then I actually do absolutely nothing about any of it other than remember the hangover, because that's also the other thing you do at events. There's some good pubs locally, just so you know. Um, so what I decided to do was break it down. And this is these things here, identity value platform. Your identity is one of the most important things you need to know for your business and for yourself. Your identity is not only about you, but it's also about the identity of the people that you serve. So your identity is, you know, what are your strengths? What, what are the things you love? Um, Vito mentioned a second ago, you know, when you find that love, when you find that passion. But also, who is it that you're serving? Vito's created a community for the people that he's serving because he knows who his target audience is. He knows what their pain points are, and he wants to create something to bring that community together who can help support each other, etc. So that's where things start with your identity. And very often, agencies might be all things to all people. So I used to run a full service agency and we did everything from building, designing, etc., through to SEO, through to app building, and we did none of them particularly very well. And we also didn't have any particular type of client. So I would often stand up in a network setting and say, I'm looking for anybody who needs an app. And I'd get crickets because you just, if you serve everybody, you kind of serve nobody. So starting with identity, and when I stood up and explained that at the event, I said, if you feel like that's your problem, 
initially, don't worry about choosing your social media platform or working out how to improve uh, your project management skills. Just go back to basics and figure out what your next few actions are to help you get that stage of transformation nailed. And I think it will be 20 each, wouldn't it? I haven't thought about this. Well, that would add up to 100%, wouldn't it, transformation? You're nodding. I don't know. Something like that. Is it 20, 25? <laughs> yeah, anyway. Uh, so what is your next stage of transformation? So we, we then talked about what can you be doing? What are the small achievable actions that you can be doing in the next 90 days to help you understand your identity? And that would be simply asking a whole load of questions and brainstorming with your team. Because once you understood your identity, then you could start to work out the value that you have to offer, but also the value that's being offered to the people that you serve. And that's where things like your pricing, your product offering, and all of those really important things come in. So maybe people at the event did understand their identity, so they therefore wanted to really listen to the value. They wanted to work out, all right, how can I put my value across to my audience? How can I increase my prices or offer better services, etc.? For platform, that was simply understanding where I should be showing up, but also what I should be saying. And that is all led from your identity and your value. If you don't know who it is you're talking to, and if you don't recognize the value that you have, then you're probably not gonna know what to say and where to show up with. So that's why you need the platform. And I don't really need to unpack everything. You probably get the idea. But everything starts there. And I was helping people at whatever stage they were at to listen to the relevant content during that event and then try and pick a few small achievable actions to help them get along the next stage of the ladder wherever they were. Because if we're not doing that, if we're just trying to consume all the content and then trying to do a bit of everything, then just like me serving uh, anyone in an agency, you'll probably get nowhere. You'll probably keep getting frustrated. So I said a second ago that the worst kept secret is to break it down. So that's stating the freaking obvious. But what I want to give you is the secret ingredients to breaking it down and keeping motivated. And the most important way that you can keep motivated, let's say you are going to write, let's, let's use writing the book as the example for the rest of this. So you've got that book inside you. You can break that book down, first of all, into small achievable actions simply by saying, this is my outline. I'm going to spend the first two days, half an hour each day, outlining the book in bullet points. I'm then going to spend 60 days writing 500 words a day. Then I'm going to spend another 10 days doing editing so that you can do things like that, break that down. But then you can be accountable to yourself and also be accountable to somebody else. The reason I launched the podcast was because I showed up to the community and said, in 30 days, the WP Innovator podcast is going live. I recorded all the episodes the day before. Uh, but I realized that I needed to go live because I was being accountable to a whole ton group of people in other people's groups. They were expecting it. They were being supportive. They were being excited. So I now had to show up. So I had to be accountable to these people. Nowadays, I'm part of a mastermind. So I'm, a, I'm accountable to the people in those masterminds. I'll tell them what I'm going to be doing and they're going to hold me to account, etc. But equally, I'm being accountable to myself. And the only way you can kind of be accountable to yourself is to track your progress. So if you've said to yourself, I'm committing to writing um, 500 words a day for the next 30 days, if a small book maybe, or even a blog post, one blog post every week if you're not actually creating content, and that's, again, 500 words, maybe that's 20 minutes. 20 minutes once a week, you hold yourself accountable you track your progress. You actually put down, hey, this Monday is when I'm going to do that blog or write that page. And then you do it and you mark it off. And you can see then how far you are along with your target. So when I was 15 pages in, that felt incredible. Because I was 15 days in, I was all these words I could scroll up and down in the Google document. I resized it to A5 so it looked like an actual book. I felt amazing. Seriously. And that's just in 15 days. I actually did back-to-back -back days. I don't necessarily recommend that because that meant on a Sunday morning I was getting up before everyone else. But I was into this. It was like I was just so excited. So within two months, bam, the book. But that's because I was holding myself accountable. I was also being accountable to my mastermind. I was being accountable to my wife, which was really helpful because I wanted... I wanted her to know that I was doing this and I was going to see it uh, through to completion. And I was also accountable to my daughter because I really want to teach her uh, that if she has ideas, that she should go for them and actually put them out there. So that's what we did. Track my progress. And without tracking your progress, 
A, you can't see you can't see where you're going and how near you are to finishing, but also you can't celebrate along the way. One of the things we forget to do, in fact, the worst thing that we could forget to do is to celebrate along the way. So me resizing at 15, uh, sorry, 15 uh, days in, uh, showing my wife, uh, it formatted as if it was a book with all the nice uh, fonts and the leading, etc. And then we went out for a meal to celebrate the fact that I'd gotten three nearly three weeks into this project and we'd gotten, I'd already gotten that far so we could stop and celebrate and congratulate us. It's exactly the sort of thing you want to do with your team. If you're at the end of a particular sprint, flip and celebrate. Uh, you know, I, I don't like pub cultures necessarily. I don't recommend that every single night, but if you can go out for a meal or just do something to celebrate the progress, the fact that you have done probably way more by breaking it down and being accountable and doing that thing over a few weeks than you probably ever would without a plan or that you would ever would without breaking that thing down. So celebrate along the way, track your progress. And here is a uh, couple of simple tools. First of all, that's pretty much how I broke down the book, nice and easy. 60 days worth of uh, 500 words, self-edit, third-party edit. So you get the idea. Um, holding myself to account, etc. But there's a few tools here. That, uh, mo Pretty much all are free or very cheap to upgrade. So Todoist is a to-do list, nice and easy. So you have, um, you can say, I think you can set yourself repeating tasks as well, but essentially you can track all the things that you want to do, the small achievable actions. What's the big thing? Break it down into a load of to-dos, set a whole of dates, hold yourself accountable, have someone else hold you accountable, and then do those small achievable actions every single day, and that will build up to the finished product. There's another app uh, here called Dailyo. It's actually the one I use uh, on, on my phone here. I've been using it now for a year and a half, maybe. And that allows me to ensure that I'm like reading my Bible every day or I'm doing my exercises every day, et cetera, because it actually reminds me of the things I need to do every single day. And has anyone ever heard of streaks? It's not running around naked. What it is, is um, it's doing something regularly, like every single day. Like Snapchat, me and Larissa have got like 800 sneak, uh, streaks. We've been snapping goofy pictures to each other for like th three years now or something ridiculous. Um, and it's really compelling when you see that number 800 and you're like, if I don't send a goofy picture today, that's going to reset to zero. That, that sucks. So you kind of feel compelled to keep going. So that's what I use in the Dailyo app is this, uh, this sort of streaks. So I've now, you can't really tell because I do like pizza, but I've been doing sit-ups now for 109 days in a row, which is pretty cool. And I can do 40 without getting out of breath, which also feels amazing. But I don't want to let that go now. I don't want to go back to zero and have to try and beat 109. So uh, that is a very good app for doing that. Dailyo is great either for reminding you to set your to do things regularly or to hold yourself accountable with those streaks. And the who's the one person you can't lie to? It's yourself, isn't it? So you're going to feel a bit yucky inside if you try and fake a streak. You can lie to a mate and not feel bad about it, but you know you lied to yourself if you didn't do it. If I didn't do those sit-ups at uh, day 105 and then pretended I did, that number of 109 would not feel good, and you'd have to just reset it. Obviously, there's your calendar. Just get them in there. I'm a big believer in calendaring out your day as much as possible, so you've got your certain types of tasks, etc. But if there is something that you want to achieve, you can set repeatable tasks. And I actually started this years ago with just a freaking spreadsheet or Airtable or something like that. So you can use a spreadsheet to just list out all those tasks. Again, hold yourself accountable uh, and go through and get those jobs done. How am I for time? Oh, OK, cool. So we're absolutely perfectly on time. <laughs> Again, another great talk. So many great actionable things in there. So many good uh, pieces of advice. Uh, do we do have some time for some questions, if we have any at all. No questions? Yes, I'm bold. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that one was coming. And the, the glasses are new. The, uh, taking on those kind of actionable tasks, is it, is it something that you, you do in your personal life as well? Do you do, is it something that you just kind of live your life by? Or is it just the business? Let me tell you what I do. So um, I'm going to open up the app because I now live by the Dailyo app. 
And today, it actually, it also tells you how you're feeling as well. So if you want to know what sort of activities make you feel good, you can then say, I felt rad when I was doing those exercises. <clears throat> and then you can look at a little report later on and you realize that watching TV and eating crisps makes you feel amazing. So maybe you should do some more of that. But uh, actually, I'm doing really well. You see all that pink? That means good. I'm doing really well at the moment. If I go back maybe four months, there's some bad days. Um, but that's been really helpful. But in the morning, um, I'll be doing my mindfulness. I've got a daily routine. I'll make a coffee in the morning. Um, and I'm actually doing all of these different activities. And then I can switch over to my street goals. And I can see that I've now read the Bible 307 days in a row, which is freaking amazing. Fantastic. Uh, and all these different things. So what I've done is I've applied it both to the personal life and to the business. So for example, I have a podcast streak in here. Uh, because we switched to solo episodes for the podcast instead of interviews, um, I'm actually, rec and we're launching a new, another new podcast. I've been recording a short 20 minute show every single day, first thing in the morning, and doing that as streaks. So I'm now weeks and weeks ahead on the podcast. That is amazing. Okay. That's, that's actually made me have a question because I think it's brilliant and I can see that like having goals, achievable goals is great. Do you think there's a danger that your life be become too regimented, that you're, it, you're too focused on these goals every Absolutely. day? Absolutely. <laughs> Which is why there is a chapter in the book about it. <laughs> so you'll find out more, but I've got a very addictive personality. Um, so whenever you're setting yourself these goals, you kind of need to be setting yourself a, a, a cutoff point as well. So the good thing for me is uh, at about, I think it's 700 days, I'll have finished the Bible and I can stop and have a rest. <laughs> yeah, because that's the whole thing done and then I never actually have to do it again. So that's that nailed. And there's, there are different elements. And also um, for these streaks of 105 days in a row, I'm not doing weekends. So it still counts. You can say, I don't want to do weekends. I'm having a break. And you can actually set that just like you can repeating tasks. So I've not, I'm not like an idiot, if you know what I mean. But yeah. But yeah, warning, you could get addicted. I think there was another question just over here. So I've worked with you on a few projects mm -hmm. now, and we're working together. And I can't believe it when you say you don't, you're someone who doesn't get things done. It's like lightning. It's just, it's incredible how far. In fact, I'm like, oh, thank God I'm working with Lee because he'll get me to do it. And I, uh, uh, so is that the result of all this? Because, well, you know, I mean, you know what I'm referring, you know, meetings yeah. that we've had. It's like, yeah, done. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so, um, but the, the yeah. difference is, is I like I've got this energy and a belief in myself that I never used to have a few years ago. When you start doing things and achieving things and celebrating along the way that I mentioned, it actually reminds you that you actually can do these things, and it gives you that extra energy to get things done. So uh, I'm used to just so um, because what yeah. I see is the clarity. You've got clarity. You just know what needs to be done. Identity. And is that is that. Um, is that a result of all these exercises? Yes, the re result of the exercises. So that's what I'm seeing. I'm yeah, not and, seeing and that gone. kind of reset of understanding that those pillars there of understanding your identity value and working your way through. Excellent, Lee. Thank you. Do we have any more questions at all? And over there somewhere, Tristan. Yes. Out of all the tasks that you've set yourself, Sorry, out of all the tasks you've set yourself, which has been the hardest to keep on top of and why? Hang on. The hardest to keep on top of has been to go out running. I've broken that one a few times because it's so cold out there. Yeah, you cool. can certainly relate to that, right. the exercising. Any, any other questions at all? No? Well, Lee, I'm so, so grateful to be able to have you up Thanks here. Thank, Thank you. Thank really, you really appreciate that. <laughs> Big round of applause, please. So we're just going to go for the smooth changeover again.
You can tell this is prepared. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I just want to say we are coming to an end here. I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to both our speakers this evening. Uh, they deserve a big round of applause. If any of you have been inspired by what you've heard this evening, uh, then we would love to hear you up here. This isn't actually that scary. It may feel like it. But actually, once you get up here and once you get into it, it's not quite as scary as it may seem. It's a, as I mentioned at the start, it's a really good opportunity to come up here and you know, start getting a feel for speaking if you've never done any public speaking before. If you're interested in going forward, uh, speaking at uh, bigger conferences, work camps, etc., then this is a great opportunity. So if you're interested in uh, speaking up here, visit wpldn.uk forward slash speak. We would love to hear your stories, your experiences. Maybe there's a plugin that you're aware of. Maybe there's a uh, theme that you're aware of. If you want to share something specifically about that, then this is a great opportunity for you to be able to do that. And this is at the very beginning. Uh, okay, so I just want to say a huge thank you to our sponsors, Weglots, Dolly, and Blue37 for enabling us to be here. If you haven't already, we would really appreciate you either Thank you to one of these sponsors on social or hitting the WPLDN uh, hashtag. Um, and there have been a number of tweets going out thanking these sponsors directly. So please do continue to support these companies by supporting us. If uh, we want to continually evolve this event, so we always want to understand what's going on, what you, what you have enjoyed, uh, what you haven't enjoyed. So we're always looking for your feedback. If you hit wpldn.uk forward slash feedback, you'll be redirected to a Google form. You'll have a maximum of four questions to answer across that form. We'd love to understand what you have enjoyed, what you haven't enjoyed, and any kind of feedback that you would have for us, because we want to continually uh, adapt and make these events better for you, the community. Our next event will be February the 27th, so we're the last Thursday of every month. And I'm happy to say that we will be back here. So we now have a new home for WPLDN, which is fantastic. If you can, we're now going to continue networking, socializing. We're going to head around to the Alice. Uh, which some of you may have joined us at the end of the last meetup. Uh, if you're not familiar, if you head out the door, right, right again, and it's there. If you don't know where it is, stick around. Uh, we can head over there as a group together. Other than that, I want to say a big, big thank you to all of you, the attendees, for being here this evening and enabling us to have this event. I want to say a huge thank you to the speakers, huge thank you to the volunteers, just thank you to everyone, really, for enabling this. If you could just take your bottles and stick on the side, that'd be great. <laughs>